Um, so please bear with me because I did do the slides on slight short notice, but uh, I've managed to give an entire snapshot of uh, the research I've conducted as um, uh, a PhD student for James. So um, yeah, I'll begin. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that everyone on this call would know what uh, CAD is. So I'm just kind of gonna skip over this slide. Um, so this is just to give an example of x squared plus y squared minus one, um, a decomposition of R2. Um, this is not cylindrical because you don't have, uh, you have say for example, S1 and S3 are non-empty, non-complete intersection. Um, if you did want to do a cylindrical decomposition of it or a cylindrical algebraic decomposition of it, it would look something like this. Now, uh, throughout this, uh, throughout my thesis, um, we've looked at mainly two projections, um, uh, two projection approaches. One is by McCallum and one is by uh, Lazard, but then sort of validated by McCallum, Paraninsky. Um, so the first one uh, to go over is McCallum's projection, um, which uses a validation called order. So you just have um, you let f be a polynomial in um, n variables, you let alpha be a point in Rn, um, you let k be the greatest partial derivative of f at alpha, that is non-zero, then f has order k at alpha. Um, then uh, to define the Lazard valuation, which uh, we sort of renamed to Lexley's valuation to keep consistency in the notation, um, you let k be any field um, and n is greater than one and you let polynomial, uh, you let f be a polynomial in n variables over the ring k. You let alpha be a point in kn. Uh, the lex least valuation uh, defined as mu alpha of f um, is the element uh, mu one up to mu n in the integers raised to n. Um, the least element um, with respect to lex least ordering, such that when f is expanded about alpha, it has the following sort of term. Um, one other thing that comes out of Lazard's approach is called the Lazard residue, which is used throughout his algorithms. I will go into much more detail um, when I discuss the nullification problem. Uh, but essentially, it is uh, the output of this algorithm, which is basically removing out the factors that sort of nullify the polynomial f at a given coordinate alpha one up to alpha n minus one. Now, the powers the, of these factors uh, is essentially the lex least, lex least valuation of f above alpha. And also, these are the first, uh, now if you take any um, alpha in um, n, n to the n, as compared to n minus one. So if you said you had alpha comma beta, where beta is an integer, the valuation of f at the new coordinate alpha comma beta, this would be the first n minus one coordinates for it. Now, uh, when I first started my PhD, the initial goal um, was something like this. So we had the idea proposed by Collins uh, in 98 to use uh, sort of order invariants to produce your um, CAD. So your CADs would be order invariant CADs. Then in McCallum 99, you had, oh, blimey, I think uh, there's a slight error in the slides, but I will go forward with that. Um, in McCallum 99, you sort of had the single equation constraints. So he took Collins' original idea and then sort of uh, used it to take advantage of single equation constraints um, and uh, produce a much more efficient CAD algorithm. And then he, uh, McCallum later took uh, advantage of multiple, multiple equation constraints in terms of your input uh, formula. And they also, there was an, uh, so essentially what happened with Lazard's idea of using the Lex least valuation was that uh, they found out there was an error in his validity proof, uh, but uh, a preprint uh, in 16 by McCallum um, and the paper was published in 19, showed that Lazard's valuation was actually, uh, Lazard's approach was actually correct, but they found a separate, uh, a different proof for it. Uh, the idea for my PhD uh, research was, uh, first of all, is there sort of an equivalent to McCallum 99 um, using Lazard's approach as a base? And then if there exists that sort of a method, um, is there a McCallum 2001 
equivalent to, um, uh, but using Lazard as the base uh, projection. So the first research output that I had was, um, it, it, it was this projection operator, which was um, quite similar to uh, McCallum uh, 99, sorry, McCallum 99, uh, but using Lazard's projection operator instead. So um, you just needed the leading coefficients of the equational constraints. You needed the trailing coefficients of the equational constraints and you needed the resultants between the equational constraints and everything else. So essentially you're uh, doing a full projection of the equational constraints. And then you're just taking the resultants of the equational constraints and the non-equational constraints. This approach of course had some pros, um, which was a smaller projection at the top level uh, you had a cleaner projection slash for your cells. So basically you were uh, ineffectively just decomposing the uh, equational constraint as compared to uh, the hypersurface defined by the equational constraint as compared to decomposing the whole of Rn. Uh, but it also did come with a few cons. It reintroduced the nullification problem, which Lazard had sort of dealt with with his approach. And also it opened up a new research problem of choosing, or rather opened up an already existing research problem of choosing an optimal equational constraint. Um, so sort of to avoid the nullification problem. Um, so my first reaction was um, what now? Because uh, it was reintroducing the nullification problem, which we kind of moved away from with Lazar's approach. So for this, um, we had to understand the nullification problem, but sort of, uh, with now the hindsight of Lazard's approach. So how does, uh, or rather why does Lazard's approach circumvent the nullification problem? The key is in the valuation and the algorithm. So in his approach, he decomposes the residue of the polynomial constraints as compared to the polynomial constraints in McCallum's approach. So in McCallum's approach, he was just trying to decompose the polynomials. In Lazard's approach, he was trying to decompose the Lazard residue as compared to the polynomials themselves. Um, and then to explain all of this, uh, we sort of defined new terminology. So we defined this object called curtains. Uh, you can view them as uh, the regions of the hypersurface of a polynomial where it nullifies. So we take a polynomial F in N variables, we let S be a subset of a connected subset or any sort of subset of Rn minus one. We say that Vf, Vf is the hypersurface defined by F or F for that matter of fact, has a curtain at S if for all points in S, um, every point above S, so basically the fiber about every point in S is uh, the valuation of the polynomial is zero. And we say that S is the base of the curtain. So the way to visualize this is you basically take a subset S and if the fiber, the entire fiber over all points in S is contained in the hypersurface, then we say that F has a curtain on S. Um, here are two examples of curtains and two different types of curtains. So uh, on the left-hand side, we've got a non-point curtain and on the right-hand side, we've got a point curtain. So on the left-hand side, uh, you've got a curtain described by this sheet that you see here. And on the right-hand side, it is a single line passing through this point here. Now, the reason why uh, it was important to distinguish these, point, uh, these types of curtains was because Lazard's algorithm and uh, even to the point McCallum's algorithm sort of, uh, no, actually I'm misspeaking, Lazard's algorithm and our version of uh, single equational constraints for Lazard's algorithm um, were fine if the polynomial constraints had point curtains. So rather the equational constraints had point curtains, but it wasn't fine if it had non-point curtains. So in order to deal with this, we uh, wrote a very uh, simple, straightforward uh, algorithm to classify curtains. Um, so this algorithm would only be able to detect curtains when we are lifting so we would assume that curtains are sort of not a problem at the N level and we project down. And then when we are lifting at the N minus one level, we check for um, all the sample points at the N minus one level. If above they would 
consist of, uh, they would be the base for a point curtain or a non-point curtain. If uh, they were all point curtains, then we would just project upwards and we would be completely fine. Um, if they constituted uh, of non-point curtains, then we would do a subroutine which decomposed all the, uh, so let's go there. Yeah, which decomposed um, all the non-equational constraints uh, with the normal projection operator, but only restricted to the curtain regions of, um, and I'm using the region terms quite vaguely, but the curtain uh, curtains of the equational constraint. So this was in a way taking advantage of the single equational constraint, but also sort of having a backup in case we did come across non-point curtains. Now, following this, I started to look at the McCallum 2001 equivalent for uh, Lazard's uh, projection operator. And uh, we came up with this where we, which is the same as uh, McCallum's uh, 2001 projection operator, excluding the middle coefficients. Um, of course, this come with this pros, uh, significantly reduces complexity of CAD algorithms. Uh, the cons, however, was again, reintroducing the nullification problem. But um, we already do have an approach of detecting curtains. Although if, for example, you had a case where you had say M equational constraints and for each of those M levels of, um, we're using this projection operator, you had to detect curtains and you found non-point curtains at every one of those equational constraints at those levels, the complexity of this algorithm would be far greater as compared to uh, just using Lazard's um, original approach. So we sort of left that route. Um, the one thing to note is that the nullification problem um, for McCallum was different as compared to the ones that we've approached because uh, for McCallum, it was more about orders not being defined in those regions. Uh, but for us, it's more because uh, we cannot lift at, that, at th those places because you're essentially trying to decompose a cross section of um, some S cross R, which is sort of equivalent to sort of decomposing RN in that matter of fact, of the entire region is valid for the equational constraint, but you need other information, which is not sort of available in your uh, sort of reduced projections. Meanwhile, um, uh, Brown McCallum came up with a new projection operator. Um, actually, that was in October of 2020, sort of close to when I was um, finishing up my thesis. Um, and it was quite similar to the Lazard projection operator, um, sort of omitting the trailing coefficients based on a probabilistic approach of detecting curtains during the projection phase. Um, and essentially in those cases where it, it, their, their approach was that you could say that there's no curtains or you could say that there may be curtains. And if there were no curtains detected, then you could um, so the, no, sorry, the approach was, this has been a while, the approach was they could detect point curtains or there may be, or there may not be point curtains and non-point curtains. So essentially, if there were only point curtains, Lazard's approach was valid and you did not need the trailing coefficients according to their method. Um, so what we did is we adapted our um, versions for single equation constraints and multiple equation constraints to their projection operator. Um, to give you a snapshot of everything that we've done so far uh, is we had Collins initial idea, McCallum single equation constraint derived from Collins 98, and then McCallum's multiple equation constraints derived from 99. Um, this should be validity 19, um, which was Lazard's idea, which gave birth to our uh, Lazard single equation constraint and our Lazard's multiple equation constraint. Then we had Brown McCallum's um, idea, which was derived from Lazard's idea, and uh, we gave rise to Brown McCallum single and Brown McCallum multiple. Now, within my thesis, which uh, I, I don't know exactly when that's going to be uh, available, uh, James, <laughs> you might have to answer that. Um, uh, we also did a lot of complexity analysis on all these algorithms. Now, we did modify the complexity analysis um, previously available, I think, in the paper Truth Table Invariant CAD by uh, James, uh, Matthew, and Russell, uh, because it, I, I, I believe it uh, sort of uh, 
assumed a certain thing about equational constraints, um, which we have sort of rectified with uh, slightly new notation. Um, and that should be available at some point, I'm guessing, um, but I'm not really sure when. Um, and in terms of future work, um, we came across this uh, interesting uh, phenomenon, uh, essentially, which was uh, McCallum's proof of 99, um, our proof of Lazard, uh, I think that's 2019, and then the Brown McCallum um, for the single equation constraint. All, all of those proofs did not really take into account much about what the valuation was being used. The only thing that um, was common out of all of them, and one property that we required in the valuation to be necessary was that it was um, upper, semi, upper semi continuous. So essentially, you should be able to distinguish between when a polynomial is zero and non zero. And that was quite interesting because it led to two questions is um, what sort of valuation would you need to have sort of a, satisfied for a general uh, projection operator and a general valuation? And also, you had sort of like if you were able to show for any given valuation that um, a certain projection operator would work, and you had the upper semi continuity property, you would then have um, a direct uh, implication of using single equational constraints and multiple equational constraints combined with our uh, sort of modified uh, single equational constraint uh, approach. The second uh, potential future work is sort of uh, trying to detect curtains earlier. So sort of investigating the approaches mentioned in uh, Brown McCallum's recent publication um, of detecting curtains in the projection phase as compared to the lifting phase that we're doing. And also looking at further implementations of uh, Brown McCallum's single equation constraint and multiple equation constraint. Um, but uh, that's, I think, where um, I sort of ended this research. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, thank you. Sorry if this talk was incredibly quick or incredibly time consuming. Mm -hmm. It was quite a short notice. Yeah. No, no, you will have plenty of time. So let's thank uh, Akshar. So yes, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Okay, so uh, Matthew and Chris, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, Chris should go first, because I went last time. Okay. All right, uh, so first of all, uh, actually, thanks so much. Uh, it's a very interesting talk and uh, very interesting stuff that you're working on. Um, so the first thing is more of a comment than it is a question, uh, but maybe it's a comment I have that I'd like to hear your comments on. Um, so, you know, what you ended up with is your last sort of future work thing is this idea of, well, if we could detect that these curtains are happening before we do the projection, then maybe we can do the projection better, right? Or if we can, maybe better to say, if we can detect they're not happening, then we can definitely do the projection better. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I think is, is, uh, really potentially valuable about the, the, idea of new CAD that I um, yeah, that, that I, I sort of came up with based on the NLSAT paper and I'll talk a very little bit about uh, is that like NLSAT and like cylindrical algebraic coverings you're actually doing you're building sample points and doing substitutions before you're doing projections right so it, it upends the order of, of CAD okay and so that makes the possibility if you're doing the substitutions before you do any projections you'll find out whether the particular point that you're using is one that has a curtain yes and uh and then the projection in in all three of those methods whether it's nlsat or um cylinder culture coverings or nucad the projection is then localized to that point yeah right so you have the possibility of saying oh well my point definitely doesn't it's not on a curtain so uh then i can you know go ahead and, and project without having to worry about curtains okay so i'm just taking down some notes as well <laughs> yeah anyway so it's just a, a thought that I, I think it's maybe a direction for your future work that would be one way you might be able to um to detect curtains sooner is if you have it doesn't have to be new cat it just has to be some kind of conflict-based approach where you're trying to build the sample point before you're doing the projection 
Okay. Okay. All right, Matthew, turning it over to you. Uh, okay. C can we go to the slide that was titled fourth contribution or fourth research? That one? Yes. So, yes. so this this was the one, if, if I understood correctly, that was generalizing McCallum 2001. Yes. But so in, in McCallum 2001, it, um, the difference between that and McCallum 1999 is that he had to include discriminants of the I have, capital I have, A. I have just realized that I've omitted discriminants in all my projections. Ah. OK. Is, is, it, is it the same then that McCallum 99, yes. your generalization yes. of 99 doesn't require discriminants, but your generalization of 2001 does? No, no, the, the generalization of 99 does require discriminants for equational constraints. Ah, so that is different to, to McCallum in uh, yes. analogy. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I do apologize. It has been three months since I've seen it. Oh, no. that, that's fine. <laughs> it's good to get it, get it straight. Yeah. But. Yeah, I'm less confused now. Thank you for uh, that. Matthew. My other question was, um, so you, you said how um, the, the, the solution you had which involved making the sub calls to CAD obviously makes yes. it more, more complex. Yeah. Can you put any kind of figure on how much more complex it is? Is it, is it unbearably more complex or is it just um, you know, it's a cost I, you have to pay, but it's better than nothing? Um, so if I'm not mistaken, I think this happened uh, so I, I haven't computed it uh, like on paper, but I think it was part of a discussion that we had that it was just, um, it ended up like if we did, a, essentially what you're doing is a, basically a sort of a second CAD at every equation constraint level. And then um, we just felt that, uh, I would say just by rough estimates that just seemed a lot more cost uh, uh, that as compared to just doing the normal algorithm. But I don't have that on paper. So do, do you have a feeling that um, it, okay, no, so is, is it implemented? That's my last question. No. Um, I don't believe the multiple equational constraints have been implemented. Okay. Uh, single definitely has been, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, Chris. Yes, the, the, the implementation of the single equational constraints was, was done by Zach in the work that Ali described. Akshar's been doing the theory. Um, I think he was in the process of uh, doing an implementation for uh, the subroutine as well, but I'm not sure if he's tested it. No. Uh, but yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. A nice talk. Thanks. Okay, Chris. I should point out that when we said it was it was very complicated, it, it was complicated. It was not only was it complicated in the complexity theory sense, it was complicated in the software construction sense. Okay, I think Chris has another comment. Yeah, um, so just uh, maybe some clarification because I'm not sure what your answer to Matthew's, one of his questions was. So you have, uh, a Lazard version of Collins 99. And in that one, you don't need the discriminant of A, right? No, 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 no. So, so Lazard's version is the uh, Lazard's original approach where he did need the discriminants. Oh, so, oh, you mean? I'm talking about uh, equational constraints. Oh, equation so in other words, um, the non-equational constraint polynomial for your your uh, Lazard version. Bear with me one second. I'm I'm just going to uh, just check my thesis because I'm pretty sure it is uh, needed. But I'll just confirm that. That's not a... with, with McCallum. You always need the discriminants of the equational constraints. Yeah, with, yeah with the you 99. Need... You didn't need them of the non-equational constraints. Yeah. So no, so um, so if I'm not mistaken, I think McCallum came out of the clarification that he needed the other coefficients of the non-equational constraints as well for 2001, for the multiple equational constraints case. And uh, the discriminants of the equational constraints um, is needed for McCallum, uh, the McCallum equivalent of 99. But what about the, the discriminant the of you... the equational constraints? Yes, but None not of, the non-equational. So that uh, is different. Yeah. That's different to McCallum then. 
So McCallum 2001 needed all the discriminants. That's right. And just one sec. Let me. Uh... Sorry, I'm. I'm just. Uh... It's, it's, it's a bet. If, if, if that's the case, it's a better generalization. I mean, not just that you've done it, but you've done it using less projection. Okay, so that is um, that is Mc that is the equivalent of McCallum ninety nine. Okay, so that's analogous. Yep. Okay, and then how about the generalization of McCallum two thousand one? Uh, just sorry, I might have to scroll down a bit more. Uh, that is the. Generalization of McCallum 2001. Okay. So it does want all, all the discriminants. discriminants. Yes. Yeah, that all that the discriminants. is completely analogous to, to McCallum. Yeah. All right. Now, if there were no curtains, hmm. then what? Oh, it, if there were no curtains in the equational constraints, yeah. Um, then we would be fine. Then you, then you don't need those leading coefficients of the elements of A or the trailing coefficients of the elements of A, right? Or the discriminant even of A. Is that true for you? Um, or did you, not, did you not, fig, you know, is that result not known? Um, actually, that is true. You, you wouldn't need the, actually, that's an interesting point, which I've kind of overlooked. Um, I don't think you would need the leading coefficients of the non-equational constraints at that point, like the the information of the non-equational constraints. Yeah, I think there was. I I could be wrong because of course I haven't proven anything about this, but I, I I would suspect that in that case only the resultant is required. Yes, in that case, no, no, that that makes sense. On. Yeah, if there were no curtains, then you wouldn't need uh, the information about the non-equational constraints. I think you only need them when you have curtains. Right, because essentially when you have a curtain, the equational constraints now just play no role inside the curtain. They don't restrict anything. Yeah, exactly, because it's 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 kind of like- so You have to project something. the other. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's like decomposing Rn essentially within that kind of yeah. region. Um, yeah. Okay, and Jasper, did you have a quick uh, comment or question? Uh, just one question. Is your thesis available online already somewhere? Um, I don't think it is yet. James, you might have to answer that. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so Akshar has not yet been examined. So it, it's become, it will come online after, after the examination, for which you can deduce that Zach has been examined. <laughs> yes. It'll be on my web page in the same place as, as Zach's is. <laughs>